The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Day by day and with each passing moment Strength I find to meet my trials here Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment I've no cause for worry or for fear Hello and welcome to the program Words to Live By. In this series of programs we are examining the home and the family. And while this topic is too broad and vast for us to be able to cover every scenario or potential idea for discussion, we do hope to give you God's instructions for the home and family and thus give you words to live by. You can then take these words and use them as your rules and guidelines to follow when making decisions about your own situations regarding the home and family. In a previous program, Keith Mosier began to talk about a specific part of the home and family, marriage. He began with the idea of commitment in marriage. In stark contrast to many who would treat the marriage as a disposable item to throw away when desired, God's plan is for one man and one woman to remain together in marriage until death separates them. The only exception to this given by Jesus himself is that of adultery. When one partner in the marriage commits adultery, the other partner may, if they choose to do so, divorce the offending partner and remarry if they choose. This is seen in the 19th chapter of Matthew. But even though divorce is an option in some cases, it is not a thing to be desired. In fact, we saw in the second chapter of Malachi, looking at verse 16, God hates the putting away or divorce. It is easy to see that this is true because for any case of divorce to occur, sin must be involved. Either the divorce is unscriptural and sin can occur, or there was adultery involved. Even though the divorce may be accepted by God, the sin of adultery that allowed it is not. As Keith Mosier pointed out to us, the plan of God for marriage is for the man and woman to remain together until death. But now we will continue with the lesson on marriage, looking at the chronology of marriage. In other words, who is to be married? When is a good time in their lives for a man and woman to be married? Is there a time when two people should not be married? Then we will look at the cleaving in marriage. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24 tells us that a man and woman shall leave their father and mother and cleave to each other. But what does that really mean? What does it take for two people to cleave to each other? Those are the questions that we are going to be examining now. Open your Bibles, join us as we continue to examine marriage more closely. Keith Mosier is going to be leading us in this study. And this program, as well as others, will be examining the plan of marriage, the home, and family as God would have it. In future episodes, we'll be looking at the roles that people are to play within the marriage and home and family, as well as attacks on the home and threats to the family and what to do about it. But for now, let's look at God's plan for the home and family, and in particular, let's look at God's plan for marriage. Well, commitment. What about that second thing? What about the chronology of it? Look back at verse 5. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother. I remember when God told Abraham to get away from his parents. But his parents were idolaters. Genesis 12, 1. Joshua 24, 15. You get away from that kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show thee. Abraham didn't quite obey God completely. He took his uncle with him and some of his cousins went over to Paden Aram, didn't even go to Palestine. That's why the Bible says in Genesis 12, 1, now God had said to Abram, he had to repeat it to him, make him go down to Palestine where he was supposed to go in the first place. Isn't that like all of us? It takes us a little while to get it right. Abram, you get away from your father and mother. I understood that one, but why is he telling me as a human being to leave my father and mother? Didn't he tell me to honor my father and mother? 
Let's go over to Mark chapter 7 for a moment and notice something about that. Leave my father and mother. I wonder what that means. What's the chronology involved here? Look at uh, Mark 7 for a moment. As Jesus chides the Pharisees and Sadducees for trying to find loopholes in the Mosaic legislation. He says to them, verse 9 of Mark 7, For while ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother. That's what I just was talking about, wasn't I? And whoso curses father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is korban. That's an Aramaic term. It means a gift. That is to say, a gift. He translates it for us. But whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. What a practice that was. Mom and dad got to an age when they needed the children's help. My mother left this life in last November for several years. Dorothy and I helped her financially. Why? It's our obligation, but it's also a matter of love, of course. But we're obligated to honor our father and mothers. That is, take care of them when they need help. These people were trying to get around that command by taking their money to the priest and saying, hold on to it. And then when mom and dad needed help, they said, Mom and dad, I'm sorry, we gave it to the temple. We don't have any money to help you. Mom and dad would die for, by neglect. They would go to the priest. He'd take his cut. They'd get their money back, most of it. Corban. What a terrible, terrible practice. However, I learn what it means now to honor my father and mother. That is, I will take care of them when I need to take care of them. But I can do that and still start a new home. I can leave my father and mother to get married. Now what's the chronology of that? Listen carefully. God doesn't want babies married. <coughs> In this country today, our children are in their adolescent attitudes into their 20s. That's the reason that teenage marriages in this country are divorcing at an 89% rate. Nine out of ten teenage marriages are divorcing. Why? They're still children. They are not adults. Now, every time I make this point, somebody who got married 50 years ago will come and say, I got married when I was 16. I'm still married. Yes, but you were 16 in those days. You had already learned how to work. You had already learned how to stand on your own two feet. These children don't know how to do that. We have a phenomenon in our country now of children coming back home after college because they're not ready to live on their own. They're not adults yet. They are not ready to leave father and mother. Young man, if you're going to marry her, you need to be in a position to protect her, provide for her, take care of her, provide for that house and any children that come along, you're the man now. You've left father and mother. And young lady, when you marry him, you don't live in mommy and daddy's house anymore. You live with him. That's a new home. Do you know the number one reason we don't get some young men at the middle school preaching who want to preach? She won't leave home. She forgot what God said about the chronology of marriage. God said, you leave father and mother. They came into my office one day when I was preaching at South Haven Church of Christ. He was 16 years old and she was 19. And they were madly in lust. They hadn't learned what love was yet. That's something you learn. You learn agape. You learn phileo. You learn storge love, but you don't have it yet. <coughs> but we're so fascinated with each other, aren't we? And they had those big smiles on their faces. And they said, Brother Mosier, we want you to do our wedding. What a privilege to do weddings. I love weddings. Takes two days out of my life. And there are three people who should never come to a wedding rehearsal. The two mothers-in-law and the bride should not be allowed there because I would get done in five minutes with that rehearsal if they weren't there. I've always known where I'm supposed to stand in a wedding. I don't have any problem with that. Don't know why I have to practice it. But you bring those two mother-in-laws and the bride in there and you're going to be there three and a half to four hours, brother. Because everybody's got to be somewhere. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, now you know how much I love weddings. Well, the wedding's all right, but that rehearsal's terrible. <laughs> anyway, they wanted me to do the wedding. I said, how old are you? I'm 16. I'm 19. I said, well, where do you work, Tim? He said, Mother Mosier, I'm still in high school. 
Somebody's got to protect and provide and take care of that family. So I looked at her and I said, well, where do you work? She got offended. I don't work. Listen to this question. Well, where are you going to live? Listen to his answer. With mommy. We read Matthew 19, 5. And I said, young man and young lady, you are not ready to be married. You're not mature enough, wise enough. You have no idea what marriage is all about. You don't know what kind of a life it is, what you're supposed to be doing. This preacher will not do the wedding. I learned years ago when you mess with the cubs, mama bear calls. And she called. She was upset with me. Why won't you do the wedding? I said, they're not mature enough, and I'm not going to help them disobey God. God said, leave your father and mother. Well, and I said, if they get married, they will be divorced within the year. I was wrong. It only took three months. Leave father and mother. I have a friend out in California named Ron Brotherton who does a lot of marriage counseling, and he advises young couples this way. He says, when you get married, you put three bridges between you and your in-laws and burn down two of them. And if you know what that's about, if you've been married long enough, you know what that's about. Every time my children, after they got married, would call and tell Dorothy about some fuss they were having, she'd have this urge to go and get involved in the fuss. No! You let them work it out. We worked ours out, she said sometimes. You have to work it out. You have to be old enough to get married. When my oldest son married... He married Cindy Claiborne, who is Winfrey Claiborne's niece. Her daddy, Lucian, who is, was an elder in the church there in uh, Dalton, Georgia, stood in front of her with a dinner plate, and he snapped it in two. I don't think I could do that, but he did. And he handed her half of it. And he said, I want you to understand, Cindy, you're always welcome here, but this is no longer your home. And let that half a plate represent that thought. You're making a new home now. That's what God said to do. You leave father and mother. And then he says, cleave to your wife. How do you do that? Let's go to Matthew 5 a moment. I mean, uh, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. I love this passage of Scripture. Paul teaches us exactly how to cleave to one another. In verse 21, submitting yourselves unto one another in the fear of God. Marriage is 100% commitment to the other person. If I had time, I'd talk about 1 Corinthians 7, but the idea is I no longer belong to me. I now belong to her. The only one that comes greater than her, well, there are three beings, but deity comes before her, and that's it. And mom, let me suggest something to you. Only deity becomes, comes before your husband, not your children. How many times have I had to deal with mothers who were ignoring him in deference to their children? That's a sin. It is absolutely the case that it takes a lot of work to rear children. I understand that. I'll never forget the day I came home and the house was a mess. She'd had one of those days. I mean, it was just chaos. She had three children. She had three children who were four and two. We had twins, two and a four-year-old. Now you talk about chaos. You ever been around two two-year-olds? as terrible as they are, and then the four-year-old, it was a mess. And I walked in in my great macho way and I said, where's supper? Well, it was about two years later that I got supper. <laughs> I understand those days. But still, Mom, he comes ahead of those children. And Dad, she comes next to God. Submitting yourselves one to another. Submitting yourselves. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. There's an attitude that comes out of this passage that says every woman is in subjection to every man. She is not. 
And there's an attitude in the brotherhood that says the woman is inferior to man. There was a professor at Harding University that I got into a written debate with who was teaching that woman was inferior to man. I asked him a question. I said, if she's inferior, inherently inferior, born that way, why does God tell her to submit herself? If she were inferior, she wouldn't have to submit herself. She'd just be inferior. She's not inferior, but she's doing this in order to cleave to her husband and fulfill a role that he can't do. Men can't do this. They cannot take the second in command position very well at all. You want to test that theory? Go to a congregation where women take the lead, some denomination, and see how many men are there. They've reversed the roles. We men think we're so great, God put us up front, right? No, He put us up there because that's the way He made us. Not because we're so great. She has something called her, His best stuff in her. You remember when He made man? He looked down there at that man and said, I can do better than that, and He made a woman. He put some of His best stuff in her, and she has the ability to take that second in command position. Why? To keep the marriage together, the home together, and the church prospering. She has a tremendous job, and she's the only one that can do it. He can't do that. He's not made that way. You women know that we are big boys, and that's all we are. We just get bigger toys, don't we? And uh, you know that, don't you? Yeah, they're all going like this now. That's right, he's just a big boy. Well, big boys like to show off. That's why I'm up here showing off today. Well... You women can do something. But what's it mean to subject yourself to your own husband, not somebody else's, sexually? Sexually, that's what he's talking about. No other way. You submit yourself unto your own husband. Now watch verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church and he's the savior of the body, it's still in the Bible. I get to make the decisions. I do. But I better take her into my confidence. That's what the Lord did with the church. He gave us the command, then He let us work it out, didn't He? He took us into His confidence. Now, here's the kind of decisions I'm allowed to make. If she wants to go to Kmart, I'll say, no, we're going to Walmart. We go to Walmart. Now, that's not so hard, is it, sisters? All you have to do is go to Walmart. Is that all right? Everybody agree? But look at the end of verse 25. You think you sisters have it hard? You think you sisters have it hard? Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. You know, right? I don't know what those women are yelling about. All they have to do is go to Walmart, but I have to die for her. Yes, I do. You see, I'm the protector. I'm the provider. But I have to be in a position to die for her. Or I'm not doing what God told me to do. Husbands, love your wives. You know how we do that? We try to do things for them. I remember when we first got married, I'd work eight hours. I'd come home, Brother Case, and I'd get out that lawnmower. And boy, I was keeping that place looking good, Riley. She must know I love her. Look at all that I'm doing for her. I provide for her. I bring her things. Meanwhile, I found out she's sitting in the house thinking, he doesn't pay any attention to me at all. Because I can't cleave to her by giving her things and doing things for her. It doesn't work for her. If you're here today with your wife, would you look at her for a moment? She's back there, Harold. Your wife, she's back there. Look at her, please. Can you look at her? Please, look at her. <laughs> he won't look at you, Pat. I'll tell you right now, she's got an ear on either side of her head. Look at your wife and see if she's got an ear. See if she does. And let me tell you something. That's where you cleave to her, right there. Right there. That's where she operates. She doesn't operate by doing things for her or giving her things or working or anything else. She operates right there. And you know what you say in her ear every day, Michael? I, you want to repeat after me, need, need you. Got that? Don't do it all at once. You'll have a heart attack. <laughs> all right. I need you. You've got to show her that. That's how you cleave to her. She operates right here. Okay, wives. Where's the statement in chapter 5 that says, love your husband? It's not here. Why? Because I'm made differently. That's not something I need to hear. I need something else. 
This big boy in this adult body needs something that only she can give me. Look at verse 33. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Okay, take a look at him. Take a look at him. Right between his shoulder blades, take your hand. Come on. Come on, Annette. Take your hand. And pat him right on the show back with the between. Go ahead. Come on. Not his knee, his back. There you go. She's hitting his shoulder over there. She can't reach around. All right. That's your job. Listen, you make him feel like that whatever he's doing, whatever his job is, he's the best at it that anybody is. And you'll keep him. But you start running him down in terms of what he does, because that's where we operate, sisters, in, in our jobs, what we do. You talk to a man long enough, he'll tell you what he does for a living. That's where he is mentally. And if you step on that, it will hurt the marriage. My husband is the best TV operator there is, right? Go like this. Tell him that today. He's the best whatever. Brother Cates is the best director the Memphis School of Preaching ever had, right, Annette? Absolutely. And she'll tell you in a minute he's the best teacher and so on. Why? Because that's her job. That's what keeps the marriage cleaving to one another. You know, we're so different from one another. Brother Wood, have you ever been behind a woman at a stop sign and she sees a car coming in the next county and she waits on it? Did you beep your horn at her? Come on, lady, let's go. I could have pulled out of there four times. The problem is her death perception is different from mine. A woman sees things much closer than we do, Michael. That's why she's waiting there. No good. That's why you get in these arguments when you're trying to teach your wife how to drive. If you don't realize the difference, bad things happen. How many of you argue over the thermostat? Might as well quit because you're eight degrees physiologically different to start with. Okay, we're different. We are just so different. And we have to learn how to do that. And if I had time today, I'd take another seat called communication because that's a big problem, but I don't have time. Let's see what happens when I have the right commitment, the right chronology, and the right cleaving. Did you notice the end of verse number four in Matthew 19? And they too shall be what? One flesh. Oh, a lot of things to be said about that, but I'm going to make this point. When I do it right, Something beautiful happens. When I was a little boy, my, we had a cellar. Not a basement, a cellar. Dirt floor. Just a space under the house, really. And there were shelves down there. My mother kept her canned goods. In those days, everybody canned, you remember. My job was to go down and get whatever she wanted off the shelf. One day she said, go get me some jam. And I went down there and grabbed a, shell, a jar off the shelf. I didn't like that job. There were cobwebs down there and it was dark. So I grabbed the first where I knew the jam was and ran upstairs with it. It had been on that shelf a long time and the jar lid was rusted. She worked at it with one of those metal things and finally got it off. Well, it had been on the shelf so long that it had completely turned to sugar. When you do it right, the longer you stay together, the sweeter it gets. You start as a Christian. He heard the word, he believed it, repented of his sins, confessed the name of Christ and became a Christian. When God took away his sins and added him to the church of Christ, placed him in his son, made him his child. And then the two of you being Christians Makes that work a lot easier. You have the same goals, heaven. You're helping one another get there. Keith Mosier has brought up some important points. First of all, marriage is a commitment. Marriage is not the trial run or the testing it out to see if it's for me. The research to find out if you are marrying the right person should be done before the marriage and not after. Once you are married, you are to remain married until death do you part. Secondly, he brought up the idea of the chronology of marriage. Marriage is something to be entered into between a man and a woman, not between two children. 
Marriage takes work and commitment and should not be entered into lightly because of the lifelong commitment that's involved. Therefore, only those with an understanding of the consequences and commitment should enter into matrimony. Thirdly, he looked at the cleaving in marriage. He stated that a husband and wife need to submit to one another. True love is putting the other person before yourself. A husband and wife should lovingly give to each other and treat each other with honor and respect. And as was stated, marriage is a 100% commitment to the other person. A husband and wife are to hold tightly to each other. Be sure and join us for our next program when we will begin looking at the marriage vow. Some questions along those lines. What value or worth do our words and vows have in marriage? Do we give the same importance to truth in the wedding vows as we do to other things we say in life? Why are the vows so important? And what impact do they have on society or even upon our children? Curtis Cates will be leading our study next on the marriage vow. But even though we're looking at the physical home and family during the course of these programs, we must not forget to mention the spiritual family. The most important family of which you can be a member is the spiritual family of God. When we rebel against God's laws and do things our ways, it's sin. And the punishment for that sin is death or separation from God. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 tells us the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's because of Jesus Christ that we can have eternal life. God has made the plan of salvation available to all mankind. We must first believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died for our sins to pay the penalty of death for us. We must then repent. That means to turn, to follow Him, to stop rebelling against God and follow His ways. Then we need to confess our belief in Christ before others, stating you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And next, you need to be immersed in water, baptized, in order that you might wash away your sins. If you've heard these words, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, and live faithfully following Christ and His commandments. Well, make sure to join us next time as we continue to study the home and family, looking at God's plan for it. Day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World, P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096, the United States of America, or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Truth For The World is a work of the Duluth Church of Christ in cooperation with churches of Christ throughout the world.